Hello, my name is KB Bisco. I'm with the forum Black Voices. Uh, Black Voices is a mission to the edification of African indigenous men and women throughout the world. So without delay, I want to say respectfully, peace and health to the family. Paz y salud para mi familia en todo el mundo. Bonjour y país a ma famille. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. Jambo. Moholo. Irio. Amahoro. Ademina. And Ademnish. European contributions to the world towards civilization prior to 700 AD were negligible. Uh, during the Dark Ages, the illiteracy rate was 98.9%. Oftentimes, historians try to credit inventions, architecture, and science to mulatto communities like the Roman and, and Greek, Greek empires. Yet and still, these civilizations borrowed greatly from Africa. The rewriting of history soon began around the year 1492. This period in history was called the Reconquista. Therefore, it is no coincidence that the same year that the Moors were disbanded from Europe is the same year that the Reconquista period flourished. This is a time when European nations sought to reconquer lands that were visited, traded, inhabited by the Moors. In fact, the African indigenous civilization was a world civilization. As a matter of fact, one of many African world civilizations. History is now bearing the facts that Africans have traveled, inhabited, and civilized many parts of the world. And this is why conquistadors like Christopher Columbus set forth to rediscover and reconquer lands that long were known by Africans in the year 1492. You see, so here are 10 facts that prove that Christopher Columbus was not the first to discover the old world known today as the Americas. Uh, number one, Columbus and the New Guinea boatmen. Europe was under the control of the Moors for over 700 years. They were pivotal in Europe's architectural, science, technology, and exploration knowledge. Uh, Columbus in his diaries was very familiar with the Moors. In fact, he mentions that he had spent over 20 years sailing the coast of Africa. Therefore, it is plausible that he knew that there was land west of Africa. However, because his math was so dreadful, he assumed it to be an alternative route to Asia. Europeans knew that the world was not flat at that time. Uh, Columbus was under the assumption it was more so egg-shaped or even better shaped like a light bulb. Here is a map of the world made in 1405 by the Chinese Muslim eunuch explorer Zhang He. If you notice, the Americas are clearly present. In essence, Columbus's bet was with loaded dice, and to make things more favorable to his advantage, he employed Pedro Alonso Nino to pilot the Santa Maria. Pedro Alonso Nino was in fact a Moor. He was commonly called El Negro. Opposed to speculation whether Columbus was influenced in his arriving to America, let's simply stick to the facts. In Michael Bradley's book, The Columbus Conspiracy, a book with the introduction written by Dr. John Henry Clark, he writes that Columbus, in fact, did not discover the Americas. He merely opened it up with the Caribbeans to European domination and exploitation. The evidence he used was from Columbus's biographer. There he writes, uh, prior to Columbus's second voyage, he was dispatched by his mentor and friend, Prince Henry the Nav Navigator, to investigate what was happening in Guinea, Africa. It had reached his attention that boatmen from Guinea were trading with the land in the West. Columbus was given the task to follow these boatmen to find out with whom they were trading. When following the African boatmen, eventually Columbus was led to discovering South America. Number two, 
the explorers. A better proof of ancient Negro arrivals is the fact of Negro colonies found by the Spanish and Portuguese discoverers on the eastern coasts of South and Central America. Pedro de Mendoza encountered a tribe of Negritos, and Vasco Nunez de Balboa encountered the tribe of Negritos in his discovery of the Pacific Ocean. They met with the old province of Coreca, at only two days' travel from the Gulf of Darien, with the settlement of Negri Negros, who were, says P. Martyr, of the fiercest and most ferocious nature. Other smaller or similar communities were found in Panuco, Yucatan, in Nicaragua, and other provinces. The only possible question yet remains, namely, what route did the Negro people follow on their way to America? Montebron is of the opinion that they came over the longest stretch of water on earth, over the Indian and Pacific Ocean, but the learned generally set forth the greater probability of their having crossed the Atlantic, where the equatorial current and fair trade winds are exceptionally favorable to westward voyages. Twice during the last century, in the years 1731 and 1764, have small ships passing from one point of the Canary Islands to another been driven by storms into the region of the trade winds and the equatorial current, and have drifted as far as America. What has happened in, in our time most often must have happened before. We should not wonder, therefore, at the early presence of African Negroes on our continent. The discovery of Negro settlements in the east coast of Brazil hardly permits any further doubt to remain on this question. If from the existence of black people in America at the time of its latest discovery, we are allowed to conclude the fact of ancient Melanesian and African immigrants, the presence of various white aboriginal tribes which we have noticed before can leave no doubt that the fair nations of the eastern continent have contributed in olden times towards the population of the new world here is a long list of westerners who have indicated that africans preceded columbus in the americas in different capacities as one visitors two settlers three traders four explorers and five shipwrecked sailors three fossils and artifacts for centuries scientists have stated that pre-clovis man was the first man to arrive in the americas it was believed that the pre-clovis man crossed the bering straits when the ice caps melted and it crossed a land bridge entering into alaska and the americas Ultimately, pre-Clovis man evolved into the Mongolian Native Americans that we have in America today. However, over the past 10 years, scientists or science has been turned on its head. A much older indigenous population has been discovered. Knowing that the ice melted 13,000 years ago, the age and location of new civilizations are obviously not Clovis. Archaeology Archaeologists have found an 11,000-year-old skull in Brazil. Human DNA by way of feces in a cave in Oregon. Evidence of humans in coastal Chile as long as 14,800 years ago. In spearheads in Texas that could date human arrival in the Americas as 15,500 years ago. Most of the man-made artifacts found in these desperate sites lack the signatures of the Clovis people. So who were these people? Where did they come from? Where did they go? Were they killed off or did they blend with the Mongolian natives? American natives today do not look like the American natives of a hundred years ago, nor did they look like the American natives of a hundred years prior. Evidence shows a blending of people a blending that resulted in a celebration of both cultures. Number four, the Olmecs. Whenever you look up the ancient tribes of Mexico, you think of the Aztecs and the Mayans. Many often ask if the Aztec and Mayan still exist today. The problem is that we normally confuse a political dynamic with race. 
confusing language with maybe races talking about descendants because the Aztecs whose language is Nahuatl and the millions of speakers of the 35 or so Mayan languages still live right where they always did. They have intermarried with other people who've either conquered them or were brought in as slaves and thus may be not pure blood Indios. But for the most part, they never left. The Mayan and Aztec empires were vast and spanned as far north as Hidalgo, going south towards Oaxaca and Tuxla and Tapachula into Guatemala and parts of Honduras and the eastern coastal cities like Tres Zapotes, Chichen Itza, and moving south along Belize. According to oral history, their cities and buildings were built by much older tribes. The old mechs who left behind giant stone faces on themselves, facing east. The Osco, who were the proto-Mayans. When you see their images next to the last full-blooded Aztec couple, you see Africoid features in both. This also explains why the Mayans called the Aztecs Chilangos for their skin complexion and frizzy hair. Something similar to what many coastal indigenous peoples hair is called today. Graspas. The Osco or Chilangos thrived during roughly 2000 BC and were later followed 200 years later by the Mandi speaking Olmecs. Leo Weiner, an American historian, linguist, author, and translator, was one of the first historians to notice the link between the Olmec and Africa. He later published his findings in his book, Africa and the Discovery of America. There hits planes that Columbus noted in his journal that the Native Americans confirmed black-skinned people that came from the southeast in boats trading in gold-tipped spears. In addition, Dr. Andres Wierzynski, an anthropologist from the University of Warsaw, noted the tradition and dress of the Olmec holy men was identical to the Mandi. Curiously, both tribes in Mexico and Africa called themselves she. He also noted the use of the conical hat that the Olmec tribes or, or, or magic men practiced as well as the Mandi. Leo Viner went further to say the kingly and priestly cap of the Magi should have been preserved in America in the identical form with identical decoration and should besides have kept the names current for it among the Mandingo peoples makes it impossible to admit any other solution than the one that the Mandingos established that will will and sacerdotal offices in Mexican. Number five, three races. This ancient Mayan mural from Chichen Itza clearly shows that three races lived in the region at the time period if you notice, you see a black race with a brown race capturing a naked white warrior. You will also notice that they came by boat. It is believed by the hairstyle and lack of clothing that the warrior, the white warrior, was Norse. As we previously established, the Norse and Vikings have oral history of visiting the Americas. Number six, the Egyptian map. This map is a 5,000-year-old map of the underworld, Amenet Neferet, the beautiful west, in tomb 100 of Hierakopolis in Egypt. Number 7. Architecture. The pyramid is one of the wonders of the world. It is yet to be duplicated or even figured out by modern engineers and architects. What is odd is that no one wondered how pyramids can be in Southwest Asia, Africa, and the Americas. If this is such a unique stru structure, how is it so commonly made? Here are a series of pictures of commonalities in architect architecture, culture, and tradition that are too close to ignore. Number eight, geopolymers. Archaeologists have theorized that the Great Pyramid was made exclusively from quarried limestone. Each stone weighed 
2.5 tons. They were dragged along a ramp that exceeded one kilometer in length and took 200,000 workers to build the pyramids in unison. Or perhaps it was simply aliens. Thanks to Joseph Davidovitz, a French scientist known for geopolymer chemistry, we now know the facts. The stones of the Great Pyramid are synthetic. According to his hypothesis, soft limestone with a high kaolinite content was quarried in the wattle on the south of the Giza Plateau. The limestone was then dissolved in large, now-fed pools until it became a ward watery slurry. Lime found in the ash of cooking fires and natron, also used by the Egyptians in mummification, were mixed in. The pools were then left to evaporate, leaving behind a moist, clay-like mis mixture. This wet concrete would be carried to the construction site where it would be packed into reusable wooden molds and in a few days would undergo a chemical reaction similar to the curing of concrete. New blocks, he suggests, could be cast in place on top of and pressed against the old blocks. Proof of the concept te tests using similar compounds were carried out at a geopolymer institute in northern France, and it was found that a crew of five to ten working with simple hand tools could agglomerate a structure of five 1.3 to 4.5 ton blocks in a couple of weeks. He also claims that the uh, Famenstele also with other hieroglyphic texts describe the technology of stone agglomeration. The Davidovitz hypothesis gained support from Michael Barsoom of material science research. Michael Barsoom and his colleagues at Drexel, Drexel University published their findings findings supporting Davidovitz's hypothesis in the Journal of the American Ceramic Society in 2006. Using scanning electron microscopy, they discovered in samples of the limestone pyramid blocks, mineral compounds, and air bubbles that did not occur in natural limestone. The process is a very detailed exercise in African genius. Why this matters in regards to the Americas? The same geopolymer formula that was used at Giza was used at Tiwanaku, Puma, in Bolivia. Number nine, the bones. In 1975, an article penned by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema was printed by the New York Times. The article stated a Smithsonian Institution team reported finding two Negro male skeletons. The men died in their late 30s in a grave in the United States Virgin Islands. This grave had been used and abandoned by native Indians long before the coming of Columbus. Soil from the earth layers in which the skeletons were found was dated to A.D. 1250. A study of the teeth showed a type of dental mutilation characteristic of early African cultures, and clamped around the wrist of one of the skeletons was a clay vessel of pre-Columbian Indian design. This is no isolated find. Skulls like that, according to the physical anthropologist Ernest Horton, closely resemble crania of Negro groups coming from parts of Africa have been found in pre-Columbian layers in the valley of the Pecos River in northern Mexico and Texas, which empties into the Gulf of Mexico. The historian Frederick Peterson, in his study of ancient Mexico, emphasized the strong Negroid substratum that intermingled with the Olmec magicians. The Olmecs were an American people who inhabited the Gulf Coast of the first millennium before Jesus. In addition, in the book Bone of the Maya, Dr. Clyde Winters is cited with the following. In addition to reports of the first Spanish chronicles, eyewitness accounts of sickle cell anemia populations in the Caribbean and Mexico, anthropologists have found sickle cell anemia skeletons at pre-Columbian sites. Some of the ancient Mayan skeleton remains indicate that they suffered 
from sickle cell anemia, an illness associated with sub-Saharan Africans. Number 10, the oral history of Montezuma and the Aztec. In 1520, Hernan Cortes wrote his second letter to Emperor Charles V of Spain. The letters were sent to Charles V to justify Cortes' actions of attacking the Aztecs against his superior's orders. But Hernan Diaz gives a physical description of the Aztec king. It is a very detailed in regards to his height, build, hair, Indian complexion, and his beard. Cortes also includes Montezuma's testimony, which details his family history. This is from Cortez's second letter, pages 104 to 107. Montezuma, I quote, My brethren and friends, you know that for a long period, you, your forefathers and ancestors, have been the subjects and vassals of my predecessors and myself, and that both of them and me, you have been always well treated and honored. You have also done all that is due from good and and loyal vassals to their liege lords and i also believe that you have heard from your ancestors that they were not natives of this land but they came to it from a great distance under the conduct of a sovereign whose subjects they all were he left them there but after a considerable time he returned and found that our ancestors had become numerous and well established in this country having intermarried with the women of the land by whom they had many children his grandson fernando educated in spain later recounts the aztec oral history in his book historia de la nacion chichimeca it speaks of their forefathers coming from the southeast in boats of bark via 12 major voyages Diego de Landa Calderon was a Spanish bishop of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Yucatan, also recorded the same oral history of the Aztecs and Olmecs, was explained to him by the natives. In Izapa Stili uh, 5 is a pictorial of the story. Here you will see seven branches to represent the seven sects of the Olmecs. The twelve roots extending from the boat of bark explains twelve major migrations from the east by water. This is the bonus. I promised the top ten facts, however, I would be remiss if I neglected one fact that is equally impactful. When Chekanta Diop and Theophili Obenga debated 20 Egyptologists in 1974 at the UNESCO conference, they proved that Egypt was purely African society through science and linguistics. Linguistics and that were rooted in the Bantu language. Linguistics are another element that connects Africa to the Americas. Constantine Samuel Raffinesque was a French 19th century polymath born near Constantinople in the Ottoman Empire and self-educated in France. He traveled as a young man in the United States, ultimately settling in Ohio in 1815, where he made notable contributions to botany, zoology, the study of prehistoric earthworks in North America also. He also contributed to the study of ancient Mesoamerican linguistics. He was one of the first to recognize a correlation between Olmec script and Mandy. Dr. Clyde Winters went even further to decipher Olmec script un even further. In African presence in ancient America, he speaks of the pre-Columbian African influences. In Atlantis and Mexico, the specifics M Mandy discovered are detailed. Through his deciphering of Mayan text, he was able to show not only Mandy roots, but an understanding of the names, beliefs, and social systems of the Olmec society. In conclusion, if I were to grade this presentation, I would mark it as incomplete. You see, I could have spoken more in detail of the Melanesian and Australian contributions to the Americas. Only within the last five years have scientists admitted their contributions. 
This is primarily due to the fact that most South American indigenous natives have Melanesian and Australian DNA. Proof of African world civilization smacks directly against racial propaganda presented as history for over 600 years. Unfortunately, the most vehement proponents of the greatest lie will look like the very descendants of the African ancestors whose legacy was stolen. However, in presence of newer DNA, architecture, linguistics, folklore, and historical evidence, pictorial evidence, excuse me, there's an old Spanish saying that simply says, no intente estafar el sol con un dedo, which means you can't raise your finger and block out the sun. So in conclusion, I ask that you like, share, and join, subscribe to these lessons. And if this presentation, I pray, will be edifying to all that hear. Respectfully, I wish peace and respect to you and your ancestors.